This lecture is about refraction and Snell's law, which governs how refraction works. Refraction is what happens when light enters a new medium and its path is bent as a result. You've definitely seen this at some point in the real world. If you look at a straw in a glass of water, you can see that the straw appears bent in the water. This is because the light leaving the straw is being bent when it enters the air and leaves the water. To explain this concept, we're going to pretend that light has different velocities in different mediums like air or water. So we're going to pretend that light moves more slowly through water than it does through air. This is not technically true, and I've left a video link in the description explaining what is actually happening. But in basically all high school physics classes, we pretend that this is true. So we're going to pretend that this rule works. Before we talk about refraction, we need to know about Fermat's principle of light. So the principle says that light travels between two points along the path that will take the least time. So if light is going from point A to point B, it's going to take the path that takes it the least time to get there. There's a classic thought experiment that's used to explain refraction using Fermat's principle of light. We're going to pretend that you're a lifeguard, you're the purple dot, who needs to save someone in the water, the red dot, and you want to get there as quickly as possible. You can run 5 meters per second on the beach and can swim at 2 meters per second in the water. So based on that information, what is the fastest path that you can take? So one option for a path is to just run straight to the water and then start to swim out. But because it takes you so long to swim in the water and you can move so much faster on the beach, you're probably going to want to spend more time on the beach if you can. So that first path seemed pretty slow. Another path option would be to run to exactly the point that the person is at and then swim straight out like this. Another possibility would be to just run in a straight line, although that doesn't seem to make quite as much sense. And another option would be somewhere in between those. And that in-between space probably is your best bet. Somewhere in there is probably going to be where the fastest possible path occurs. There is a way of determining exactly which path is fastest. And it requires calculus to prove, and this course doesn't assume that you have calculus. So I'm going to leave that video of how to prove this in the description, but there is a proof to find the exact fastest path that you can take. And when you solve out that proof, you're going to get this rule for the relationship between the angle that you leave the beach and the angle that you enter the water. So this rule that I've written on the left, c over v1 times sine of angle 1 is equal to c over v2 times sine of angle 2 is called Snell's law. And what this law is doing is saying based on the velocity that you can travel through each medium if you're a particle of light, these are the optimal angles to leave one medium and enter the new medium so that you travel in the least amount of time. So you obey Fermat's rule of traveling in the least amount of time. So if light is moving from one material where it has a certain velocity to another material where it has another velocity, and because it always travels in the path that will take the least amount of time, it's always going to obey this law, Snell's law, when it's moving from one material to another. Because the speed of light c over the velocity appears in both sides of the equation, we give it a special name and we call it the index of refraction. The index of refraction of a medium is the ratio of the velocity of light in a vacuum over the velocity of light in that medium. So the symbol n, the index of refraction, is equal to the velocity of light in a vacuum, which you know as c, over the velocity of light in that specific medium, v. So writing Snell's law using this variable n gets us n1 sine of theta1 is equal to n2 sine of theta2. This is an example problem using Snell's law. Light moves from water, where it moves at 2.25 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, to glass, where it moves at 1.81 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. If it exits the water at 25 degrees from the vertical, what angle will it enter the glass at? So I know Snell's law applies here. Rearranging to solve for the angle, we're trying to find angle number two. It's arbitrary which number angle you use for which medium, as long as you keep it consistent. So I'm calling glass material two here. So solving for theta by itself gets me this equation. And I know that the index of refraction of the water is the speed of light in glass. And I know that the index of refraction in water is the speed of light in a vacuum, three times 10 to the eighth over the speed of light in water, which is 2.25 times 10 to the eighth, which is equal to 1.33. And the index of refraction in glass is gonna be 1.66 using that same rule. 
So I can now plug in these numbers into the index of refraction for each material. And I'm also plugging in the angle that it leaves material number one, the water width, 25 degrees. And when I do that, I find that the new angle that it's going to enter the glass with is 19.9 degrees. So you can see there it was bent toward the normal. It's closer to the normal line than it was before. It's at a smaller angle than it was before. So that's how you use Snell's law to calculate the path of light moving from one material to another. So based on Snell's law, when light moves from a higher to a lower index of refraction, it bends away from the normal. And when light moves from a lower to a higher index of refraction, it bends toward the normal. So you can see that this makes sense given the proportions in Snell's law. If I make some variables bigger, I have to make other variables smaller to balance out the equation because sine gets bigger as the angle gets bigger. So you can see this is why if n1 is greater than n2, the light will be bent away from the normal, and if n1 is smaller than n2, it will be bent toward the normal. Just a note, nothing can move faster than the speed of light in a vacuum, so the velocity of light in substances must always be equal to or lower than c. This means that the index of refraction can never be lower than 1, because its denominator is always equal to or less than its numerator. So just to prove that, because the velocity of light in a substance is always less than or equal to the velocity of light in a vacuum, I can rearrange the equation like this and show that the index of refraction must always be greater than or equal to 1. You can't have a smaller than 1 index of refraction. When a wave enters a new medium, its velocity and wavelength change, but its frequency stays the same. This is a really important fact that comes up again and again in labs and on tests. This can be used to predict the wavelength before and after it enters a medium. So when a wave is moving from one medium to another, at the point that it's changing from one medium to another, that point must oscillate in the same way on both sides. Otherwise, the wave would kind of break up and form two different waves. So that one dot must oscillate up and down at the same rate on both sides of the medium. So that means that the frequency has to stay the same on both sides of the medium. But the velocity is changing, and so because the velocity is changing and the frequency is staying the same, the wavelength must also change to accommodate that. So this is an example problem using that fact. Light moves from glass with an index of refraction of 1.66 to water with an index of refraction of 1.33. If the wavelength of the light in glass was 7 times 10 to the negative 7th meters, what will be the wavelength in the water? So I'm going to start by calculating the velocity of the wave in each material. This is what I get for each. And now I can take this velocity and combine it with the wavelength to find the frequency And I know that the frequency is staying the same for both materials, even though the wavelength and the velocity are different. So now I can take that frequency over to this other side to calculate the wavelength in the water, which I find to be 5.7 times 10 to the negative 7th. So these are the rules for when light goes from a lower to a higher index of refraction and when it goes from higher to lower. You can see how the angle from the normal is affected, how the wavelength, velocity, and frequency are also affected. We can also show wave fronts moving from different indexes of refraction. And you'll notice that here the wavelength decreases and here the wavelength increases. When light is refracted in a surface, it is possible that some of the light is reflected off of the surface as well. The portion of light being reflected follows the normal rule of reflection. The angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So if you ever see a problem asking what each of these beams of light will do, you know that the reflected light will bounce off with the same angle as the original, and for the refracted light, you'll need to use Snell's law to find that missing angle. And that's what you need to know about refraction and Snell's law.